So good evening and uh, welcome. It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Farshid Musavi. Um, there are uh, a lot of times when per personal histories and institutional histories uh, coincide and I'm very happy that my, uh, my personal history, my life has uh, uh, coincided at many points during the past 20 plus years. Uh, with Farshid, it seems like yesterday when uh, we were upstairs here working together um, in the fourth semester core. She was still a student then. Um, and um, over the years, it's been really, really inspiring and it's been such an incredible honor and pr pleasure to see her go on uh, from the GSD to work with uh, she worked with Renzo Piano at one point, then at OMA, and of course the formation of FOA that uh, was uh, such an important um, practice and uh, the winning of the Yokohama uh, Port Terminal. I think it was one of those really critical projects of the last uh, 20 or so years uh, because it really brought about um, a lot of uh, new ideas, the, the relationship between architecture and engineering, architecture and landscape, alternative ways of thinking about architecture, and really the, the formation of new kinds of public spaces uh, in the city. Uh, the practice went on to do a number of uh, other projects, and uh, amongst them was one of the projects that, that Farshid discussed here, I guess a year or so ago, a couple of years ago, um, the, uh, the John Lewis uh, uh, partnership building, uh, but also many, many other buildings. I was very lucky to be able to visit the uh, new building that Farshid has done uh, since she set up her own uh, firm um, almost, is it two years old, a year and a half, yes, a year ago in Cleveland, which is the new Museum of Contemporary Art, which we will see uh, tonight, uh, really an extraordinary, not a huge building, but an extraordinary building in all sorts of ways, dealing with the question of the museum today, dealing with um, building uh, uh, in the context of uh, American practice, uh, and also really working with curators uh, in, uh, in new ways. Throughout this period, I think one of the things that has been uh, very important and distinct, uh, whether it was during the time that uh, Fascist was, was teaching in, in, in London or in Vienna, and then of course uh, for the past uh, many years here at the GSD, the emphasis on, on research, but also research through architecture. I think this has been a key component of her studio and has always been combined together with seminars that obviously a number of them have resulted in publications, namely the function of ornament, the function of form, and at some point, hopefully in the next year or so, the function of style. Uh, Farshid is the person who has mentioned the word affect more than anybody else uh, I know in the past few years and really put it to good use and probably defined it in new ways in, in terms of its relationship to architecture. I think in the, in the context of both the function of, of, of ornament and the function of form, she has um, presented us with the, with the fact that we have to really think about the production of architecture in different ways. Namely that, for example, in the context of, of the discussion of ornament, that the ornament is not simply an applique, a thing added to the building as a sort of symbolic repre representational element after the fact, but that it is a consistent, integral, coherent part of the, of the project of architecture and it's something that is part and parcel of the way that contemporary architectural practice has to understand its tools, its mechanisms, its materials. And in that sense, ornament actually becomes, like the discussion of functional form, very much a materially based approach towards the production of, uh, of architecture. In a um, recent contribution that she made for our instigations uh, book, Engaging Architecture, Landscape, and City, which is forthcoming, and most of you haven't seen it, Fashid says that if architecture is to address 
these evolving scenarios, its engagement cannot be limited to simply identifying each one and treating it as an isolated phenomenon. Architecture needs to frame them within its own history of thinking and production. Social and cultural concerns need to be examined in conjunction with existing concepts and tools to allow new connections and the creation of new paths of thinking about historical processes of change, as well as pointing to the changes that need to be made to the tools and concepts of the discipline. Accordingly, architecture moves beyond merely reaching to historical processes and engages them in an active manner. In this way, unpredictable processes are harnessed to shape the future. I think it's undoubtedly the case that this emphasis on the, the role of the discipline as, as, a, as part of the, the methods and mechanisms for really thinking about the future of architecture has been very much at the core of what Farshid has been doing and may it be uh, part of what she will continue to do here at the school and in her practice in the coming years. Please welcome Farshid Musavi. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Mohsen, for the opportunity and for your generous introduction. Uh, this lecture is, uh, is a very special lecture to me because I'm speaking in front of my teachers and my students. Um, it's uh, one of those moments uh, that I love uh, at the GSD the most, uh, like the beginning of the year presentations when uh, teachers and students come together and uh, I may be standing uh, uh, there presenting uh, but in that context and surrounded with my teachers, I uh, remember that I'm still learning. And, and I think that that is a feeling that I have tonight and a feeling of intimacy also that makes me want to share with you uh, certain anxieties that I have uh, right now uh, and also certain, uh, certain matters uh, that excite me. So that's really the spirit of the lecture. Um, I've called it uh, the uh, style agency and... Um, it, I mean, I would say I'm not going to, uh, just because I didn't want to turn it into an academic uh, lecture, and I would like to focus in on, on, on the work of uh, the office, uh, the content will be um, very much the content that is inspiring the, the style research, uh, but I won't go specifically into the discussion of style and focus more on the issue of agency. Um, so. Architectural agency is a matter of what architects do, and in particular, what they do that challenges the hierarchical order of a given social arrangement. Tying yourself around a tree and talking about it is not an architectural way to save that tree. Um, equally, limiting architecture to form, space, and structure doesn't engage formal decisions in societal issues. Contemporary architecture is inundated by two tendencies. One that is interested in architecture's relationship to life, involving issue, issues such as the environment or economy, and another that is focused uh, on architectural formal investigation in autonomy, sparked by our excitement around digital tools. The field of aesthetics can bring the two together. Aesthetics, as Jacques Rancière has said, has an inherently political dimension, just as politics has an inherently aesthetic dimension. In his definition, aesthetics goes beyond questions of the sensible and feeling and embraces the intellectual aspect of the sensible and vice versa, rather than valorizing one or the other. The challenge confronting contemporary arch architects then is how to maintain what Rancière calls dissensus, the possibility of disrupting the perceptual and epistemic underpinnings of problems, the obviousness and naturalness that attaches to them. Dissensus reminds us of Nietzsche's discussion of the untimely power to transform or reinterpret historical reality, or the lesser's proposal for breaking through history to produce instances of becoming. The census or instances of becoming are about acknowledging present conventions or givens, and therefore history, but disrupting what is given and the frame in which we sense something is given. This process has to abandon current hierarchies that are based on consensus and treat all subjects as having equal aesthetic worthiness. So the research I've conducted here at the GST has very much been around the subject and it has tried to embrace slices of architectural history that relate with the questions of aesthetic in architecture such as ornament, form and currently style 
to show its discontinuities, how differently consensus has been reached about concepts over time as a way to open the possibility of dissensus today, the possibility of redefining them again to shift them into a new direction as, uh, so that they can become productive for the present. And what interests me in exploring in the office, um, uh, through the work of the office, is to explore further the aesthetic function of architecture to extend occupation with structure and form and space to the concern or the con or the concerns with the sensible to embrace the sociological and psychological content or the intellectual in architecture to break the split between architecture and life or the object and subject so that architecture's agency can be diverted towards influencing society in specific ways this doesn't mean abandoning the formal or the technology in investigation but to do them not in isolation it doesn't mean investigating the psychological content in isolation. It is necessary instead to include people's interaction with the process of design in order to identify where architecture's agency lies. So since um, John, the John Lewis project, the department store in Leicester, I, I should mention that I have been collaborating with a, a co photographer that, that I admire the work of greatly. He's a fantastic photographer, Stefan Gill. And um, he's been photographing uh, the Leicester Project and recently the MOCA in Cleveland. And the images that follow and most of the, the photos of MOCA are really his. Here is an example of this interaction in FOA's Cineplex in Leicester with an envelope that transmits reflectivity, glare, and deformation. There are a couple of points around the building where all passes by stop and salute the building <laughs> systematically, <laughs> no matter what sex, age, Something happens in the space between the building and these people who look at it. <laughs> the lesser's interpretation of affect has helped me to understand this interaction between architecture and society. Affect, he says, is distinct from affection. And affection, such as feeling mood or uh, uh, feeling a, a mood or emotion, relates to the state of a body which is due to the action of another body or form. Since these affections need to be enveloped by the body, it is subject to personal, biographical, or social mediation. We don't know what a mood or feeling the dazzling surface of the pose has created, uh, or the pose has created in each one of these people. Affect, on the other hand, is an intensity transmitted by the form, uh, the specific qualities of which depend on the characteristics of that form. Affections, therefore, are the effect of uh, form on individuals and are subject to different types of mediation, whereas affects are pre-personal and unmediated and therefore can generate different kinds of affections. Here is Yokohama's, um, the Yokohama terminal, uh, different images of different uh, levels of it, uh, and as a kind of a suggestion of the kinds of affects that it uh, triggers. Uh, in the parking, which is the lowest level, we could say affects of flatness, openness, axiality, perhaps efficiency. In the middle one, which is the terminal level, arching, pleating, diagonality, asymmetry, purposefulness. And the top one, which are images uh, of the, uh, the plaza, perhaps valley, landscape, mountain, perambulation, etc. Now, these are then uh, processed by the senses leading uh, to unique affections as uh, suggested by these images. The way people perceive forms is influenced by affects. But since affects are pre-personal, they do not determine how people perceive them. It is for this that architects need to focus on affects and not meanings. This is not that meanings are irrelevant, but that the affects are the area that architects can uh, that generate and, and, and can influence uh, the interaction of people through. For me, what gives affect the public agency is that it allows collective experiences to be at once shared and impersonal, rather than seeking to produce a common um, voice or consensus, affects help create the fabric of a common experience in which new modes of subjectivity may be developed. Now, each project, uh, as suggested by the kinds of uh, bits that are in this uh, uh, slide, uh, bring forth various kinds of material, many of which involve the expertise of others that are involved in the design process, and each will be unique to, uh, and they will be unique to each project. Within the large team involved in the design process, the role which is unique to the architect is to assemble all of these materials into an aesthetic system or forms determining what presents itself to sense experience. 
The architect's role is not disengaged from life of the project. The architect includes, excludes, and distributes a project's sensible materials in a particular way rather than subjecting the project to an already agreed image of an architectural problem. The result in built forms, the result is built forms that are different, which therefore produce different perceptions and therefore different experiences. So we could say that architecture's discipline specific agency is to influence the way in which individuals interact with built forms. It is in this context that the ornament um, research proposed a new definition of ornament with an aesthetic and ex or expressive rather than representative or mimetic function. This does not represent consensual approaches to architecture, for example, whether the structure is more le legitimate or the surface. As you see here, this is the content page of the ornament book, and I think perhaps something that has been overlooked, uh, how it taxonomized different projects uh, being generated through ornament, structure, screen, or surface. Therefore, any one of these elements can be instruments through which an architectural project can be expressed and through which it can find agency. The focus of the contemporary ornament is then on redefining conventions around which forms are conceived and therefore how they are perceived. At FMA, currently, we are working on one project which is a total new construction. Another project where the entire envelope has to be stripped away and rebuilt. Another project where the entire core has to be completely gutted out and, and rebuilt. In order to, uh, to pursue uh, the agency which is linked to affect rather than pure formal in investigation, in each one of these projects, we've had to identify which part or part of the architectural assemblage are linked to preconceived conventions or perceptions and to engage those rather than others. Now, with this in mind, I'm going to show you, I'm going to go through three projects, two of them briefly, uh, to set in context uh, as this kind of more general discussion, and then to focus uh, on the third project. So, um, firstly, the Yokohama project, which uh, is, a, is a form, I would say, that subverts the sense of monumentality in a terminal. The John Lewis project, which is the envelope as ornament. Um, and it subverts the blankness of a conventional department store and the Mocha Cleveland, which uses the entire form to subvert the museum as an institution. Now, the Yokohama Terminal uh, subverts these kinds of precedents. These are ferry terminals um, and their sense of monumentality. It tries to subvert this sense of monumentality and it uses its entire form to disappear within the harbor of Yokohama to become an open space. This implied engaging the structure, circulation, and on all of its surfaces. Instead of specialized and isolated routes found typically in terminals that prioritize passenger wayfinding and eliminate choices, the circulation is designed as a series of interconnecting loops to multiply the exchanges between people and give them choices. Instead of typical post and beam structure that is easily rep repeatable along a long building, the form is structured with a long span steel structure that treats levels as continuity and avoids columns that would subdivide the open space. This embeds the terminal with continuity, seamlessness between interior and exterior, as well as openness. To embed the interior with uh, a sense of transience that is ne needed for public space, uh, all mechanical plants and luggage handling, uh, handling units are concealed within the wood flooring system. Immigration borders are designed on wheels, uh, inverting their rigidity. To make interior and exterior further continuous, only three architectural finishes are in introduced to the steel shell, um, and these are extended throughout the interior and exterior. A further sense, sense of continuity and openness is therefore achieved. The terminal has become a very public open destination, uh, public space, attracting two million passengers, a, a, a visitors a year that are non-travelers. This is a pop-up concert in the terminal, and here are people who go there to sit down and draw. And these are, uh, for me, evidence that there has been, the, we have achieved a, a kind of a subversion of what a terminal uh, is normally is. 
uh, you are not supposed to go to a terminal, a ferry ter terminal to sit down and draw. And so by shifting the terminal's monumentality, it has indeed become a public space that responds, um, um, that, that people respond to in, co in con unconventional ways. Now the John Lewis department store focuses on subverting the blankness of the conventional department store. Here, the envelope of the building is designed as a screen to turn the department store into a semi-transparent building that is connected to its context. The envelope of, of the generic department store maximizes display area, minimizes visual distraction, and avoids exposing clutter of the interior and, and its changing displays. Conventionally, it pre presents such blank expressions. The interior of the Jean Louis store is comprised of a grid of columns and a bank of escalators and nothing else, an open space for different sales departments. Therefore, introducing transparency through the envelope impacts the entire floor and not just the zone around the perimeter. In order to pri provide privacy to the retail floors without completely cutting out views and light, the envelope is designed to perform as a net curtain with a pattern that, eliminates, uh, that mediates between different scales of individuals, a technical scale uh, that provides 40% opacity to gain the necessary U values. I'm trying to, in a way, suggest the different material that uh, generate uh, the, the screen and uh, that are not necessarily uh, initiated by, by the architect, but that the architect assembles them. Um, the screen is double in layer uh, with the pattern uh, introduced uh, to both at the same scale and aligned exactly. Uh, and therefore, from the interior, um, people would be able to see uh, through clearly so that the envelope would transmit full transparency. Uh, and at the oblique, the two layers uh, fill each other's gaps. Uh, and therefore, the pattern becomes twice as dense. And therefore, it achieves much more privacy to evoke um, lightness um, or the sensation that this is a fabric uh, wrapped around uh, the floors. Uh, the seams had to be disguised and the pattern uh, four templates or variations of the pattern are developed that meet, uh, that are different internally but meet at the edges, edges in identical ways and therefore they can be mixed and matched and, and produce a seamless but differentiated pattern. Uh, other materials uh, have to be incorporated, such as uh, glass sizes, manufacturing, basically, um, that comes in limited sizes, five meters tall, and therefore the pattern, uh, the template has to be proliferated in numbers. Structure, the presence of structure has to be minimized uh, so that vertical seams are almost invisible. Uh, and this uh, brought us this kind of question, in a way that the, the seamless of the pattern takes us to, to design an innovative uh, structural system for the glass where uh, glass is being hung from the top rather than rested uh, 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 being held by the floors and every other glass is being held by the glass neighboring it and otherwise by hangers that are, that are uh, held from the top of the building and therefore uh, the whole uh, system works literally as a single fabric. The pattern is fit in mirror to incorporate time and the surrounding environment. And, and this uh, produces this assembly of mirror frits, stainless steel bolts, glass panels, spandrel panels, steel hangers, uh, glass catwalks and lights, etc. that together uh, articulate the way the, the, the store um, uh, presents itself, uh, its system of expression. Um, shopping in the store as a consequence, is not an environment with full artificial lighting. And the sensation of a sealed closed space is replaced by transparency and a certain connection with the fabric of the city outside. From the exterior, privacy takes uh, precedent. Uh, a moiré pattern is generated, which is weightless by the day as it is reflective, heavy by, by night as, as if it is made out of iron, seamlessness, concealing the clutter behind, multivalence, perhaps we could say. Now, none of these affects were, of course, given by the functional brief, but they've been grown through it. And they're vital, they've become vital um, to the way the department store is experienced. For me, um, here, uh, the architect's agency is uh, to deliberately challenge how 
people experience this kind of building, redefining it away from the blank, sealed, monumental box to an object that is embedded in its context, changes offering different experiences. Now, uh, Mocha Cleveland is a project where we could explore ornaments through the entire form, since it's a museum, where Yokohama project um, subverts the form of a terminal to a park, and the John Lewis project subverts the blank box conventions of a department store to introduce transparency. The MOCA project subverts the form of a museum from being an institution to a flexible configuration that evokes contemporary art. Now, just as a brief background to uh, MOCA Cleveland. Now, MOCA is a non-collecting uh, contemporary art museum. It was founded in 1968 in a former frat house by Marjorie Talalay, Agnes Gant, and Nina castelli Sandel, then named the New Gallery. In 96, the center moved to a former, to the second floor of a former Sears store, as you see on the right, for six years, and later it was renamed as the Museum of Contemporary Art. In 2006, we were selected to design a 34,000 square feet new home for MOCA with a construction budget of 18.7 million. So MOCA is both small and very low budget. As you know, uh, during, as you may know, <laughs> during the last two years, uh, my studios here at the school have focused on confronting the very large type of contemporary art museum of the last two decades where pressure to find subsidy has meant the introduction of commercial, ancillary commercial, public, and educational programs to the museum inflating its size and making the museum an, an institution and no longer a flexible configuration. To sustain this institution as a destination independent of the galleries, architectural features such as colossal empty atriums, as well as additional circulation space have had, it, have had to be added to move visitors from art to non-art spaces. As much as I admire these works for their architecture, their architectural promenades set in large spaces devoid of any art frees the experience of going to view art to an object to be viewed. It is the architecture alone that confronts people, not art. This is why museums can treat their exterior and interior isomorphically, because the interior doesn't have to confront art, but architecture again. The galleries, meanwhile, are treated like a typical white cube, which again isolates the experience of viewing art from the experience of the museum. The galleries in most of these museums could in fact be in any other building. The two closest comparisons in scale to MOCA are probably the uh, contemporary art museums in San Luis and Denver and the upcoming one in Aspen. The new museum and the ICA, just as a way of background, share certain similarities, but they are in fact twice as large at around 60,000 square feet. MOCA is situated on that pink triangle, side, triangular site in the uptown district of the University Circle, home to the arts, education, and commerce of the city. And MOCA's ambition is to become an urban living room for these institutions. Hopefully, we'll come back to this issue. Working on MOCA was very hard, as we needed to cater for social and commercial needs of the museum without the additional space or the budget. But this forces us to look for ways um, that the art, social, and commercial spaces could cohabit. And I think this is where, as architects, we found our agency to design the museum as a flexible configuration to challenge the convention of a museum as an institution. So MOCA became an experiment with the idea of transience. Since the gallery did not have the budget for separate commercial and art spaces, the question was, can art spaces host other, sp uh, host other spaces? And can, conversely, social and commercial spaces be treated as events, just like exhibitions, rather than permanent spaces? Instead of a flexible gallery surrounded by social and commercial spaces, can we design a multiple gallery? At times, we use as a gallery, and at other times, a social or commercial venue. Works of certain contemporary artists, such as Carson Holler, are, hint, are a hint that the gallery space is, in fact, very well suited for social or commercial events. So the whole museum can be designed as spaces for, the, for arts, and, there, um, and these other functions can colonize them over time. So what should a space for contemporary art be like? In my opinion, the agency of a contemporary art museum building 
should be to evoke through its physical as assemblage and environment what contemporary art stands for at large, those being transience or permanent contemporaneity, boundlessness given that contemporary art has no borders or history, dialogic rather than monologic since it is in a continuous dialogue with other works, scalelessness as it ranges in scale uh, enormously, openness given that half of contemporary art currently no longer uses the gallery wall, diversity in ambient lighting, diversity in climatic needs given that its range of medium and subject matter requires different conditions. All these point to the architectural challenge, how to negotiate demands for spatial diversity with the demand for flexibility or change. How a museum can be shaped to provide different scenarios uh, of spatial diversity over time. This is a different approach to museums such as the Guggenheim Bilbao, whose complex shape may provide spatial diversity, but as a frozen scenario. MOCA is arranged over four floors to explore the complexity that contradictory demands in the museum can generate by designing specific plan shapes for each and combining them. The entry floor is hexagonal to fully occupy the corner of its triangular site while leaving space for a plaza. This location exposes the museum on all of its six sides, which are used for multiple entrances to the museum. So it can be subdivided into distinct areas that can be accessed separately. Imagine a Roscoe Chapel on the entry floor and a large group show on the fourth floor gallery, both being shown at the museum simultaneously. For the Roscoe Chapel, the experience of arriving to it directly is essential. And this is what having multiple entrances gives the museum. The top floor, on the other hand, is rectangular so that it would subdivide easily into rectangular exhibition spaces. <coughs> These two floors define the form of the museum in between which two other floors are inserted. The floors are then differentiated further as a consequence <coughs> of their structural design. The top floor only supports its own roof and therefore is designed with a light, long span structure and therefore becomes ideal for larger exhibitions. The lower floors are encumbered by structure, a grid of columns, and are designed for smaller exhibitions or events. The transition between the, hexagon, the hexagonal and rectangular floors introduces slanted walls along the perimeter, which is fully exposed at the point where the main circulation here, um, stair cuts through to provide access to all four floors. Here, the leaning perimeter envelope, which is revealed, as well as the stair, participate in enabling curatorial continuity and interaction vertically, which is a problem that arises when you have a multi-story museum. Another element which explores time, um, change over time, is, is the staircase uh, that I have just uh, located for you. The stair geometry, as seen here, um, is defined through a process of negotiation between the spaces on each floor to which it plugs into and the leaning profile of the form. This is actually a, a, a view that you would never see. Uh, uh, the, the envelope has been taken uh, away. To multiply vertical continuity and save space, one of the egress stairs is stacked under the public stair. The double-decker stair inverts the typical linearity of a stair by giving visitors 10 different ways to spiral in and out of the closed uh, and open routes. In the same spirit that the double helix spiral stairs at the Vatican Museum provides two routes and evokes a sense of infinity. The idea of infinity has been explored in contemporary art as a phenomenon. For example, in Yoyoi Kosama's uh, infinity room a mirrored uh, room at the Tate Modern, this image relates to it, or for example, James Tarot's work with infinity through light. At MOCA, the spiral experience of the stair pl plays out as a photomontage of varying pace. There is no single point in the building where the stair is seen in, in its entirety from below. To experience it, visitors have to move through it. The lower route is closed and it has to act as an egress there. Therefore, it, is also, it can also be used as a sound gallery to invert the sense of compression that such an enclosure would bring and to push the boundaries of vision, it is painted yellow all over. 
The yellow paint provides a constant in intensity of yellow and continuous presence. There is no measure in the space as everything is yellow. It is scaleless, without borders. The yellow color all over dematerializes the space, making it weightless. It is difficult to judge the depth, a perception of unending space results, a challenges visual perception of the space. Is it a view of nothing or infinity? For sure, its sense of boundlessness can be disorientating. And the handrail is likely to be used a lot more here. The upper route is open. From below, it appears bulky. And yet, it is made out of steel, sheets of steel. Once on the stair, you find it paper thin, as you see here, and, but very stiff, encouraging people to lean into it for support. The upper route unveils itself slowly as a stair that leans forward as it climbs, following the leaning profile of the building. Landings are wide at every floor, um, bringing about uh, small spaces of social interaction. The open route plays out as a panorama in which movement sh slows down and influences people to look up, or to take in a much larger scene of which many actors and spatial agents participate, such as the dry workshop um, of the museum that, for example, is exposed to view. Therefore, movement along the open route shifts from one of extreme collectiveness to a singular experience. It extends above the fourth floor gallery, this open route, giving visitors a different point of view of art within while it is under construction, when artists are at work or exhibitions are being set up. So by allowing visitors to know about aspects of the museums which are not conventionally associated with a visit to an art museum, the identity of the museum as a place for viewing art in this conventional way changes too. There is something interesting in this business of looking into the art handling spaces because the one who usually controls what is observed is being observed. For me, the stair is one of those elements in the building that has agency. As a consequence of how it has been designed, its tectonic resolution, it provides visitors with multiple perceptions of the museum, a space that is at once individual, <coughs> collective, infinite, and exhibition, a place of production. Now, contemporary art, uh, uh, contemporary art at large is, of course, uh, evidence from the many f different forms that it comes in, stands for multiple points of view. The museum has picked up on this, not only in the design of the staircase, which allows you to experience the museum from multiple stances, but also in the design of each floor of the museum, which is provided with switch elements, um, such as, for example, two points of access on every floor, the, the blue and the yellow, that allow you to, to weave in and out of it. Uh, or, for example, movable walls. This floor can be configured in different ways. Glass walls that allow spaces to be used for art or admin, movable walls that allow the second floor to be used in a variety of ways, a guillotine wall that comes down and subdivides the entry floor, extra doors to allow toilets to work for multiple entrances, glass wall between the museum store and the shipping receiving area so it can be used as a gallery, a cafe on wheels, a lifting door to the receiving area so it can double up as an outdoor performance area. Together, they fill mocha with spaces that are multiple. Without describing each scenario in detail, here are some of the different scenarios or different ways in which the entry level can be used for uh, art or social and commercial program over time. Here are other scenarios of the second and third and fourth level and its different scenarios. The complexity of Mocha's interior is time-based. Over time, people's engagement with the museum will be different as many of its spaces will be changing over time. This is a space on uh, the entry floor, with shelving and display cases to one side and a glass wall at one end. The cash desk wheels out and gets plugged in. The shelving opens, revealing merchandise. Other display cases are rolled out and positioned to form the museum store. At other times, the displays are parked into the wall and this space is used for performance art. And the art receiving area at the end transforms to a stage. The receiving door is concealed as part of the exterior cladding, a little bit like a James Bond house. 
It opens to reveal the art receiving area, but this space is also a little theater as it fronts a sloping part of the plaza. The open stair doubles up as a venue for musical performance. The bar is designed on wheels. You can just about see it uh, at the end, align the space to be a cafe or to host other kinds of social events. The guillotine door in this space divides it for social events or keeps it continuous with the space of the lobby for a large exhibition. Given these switch elements throughout the museum and the diversity of spaces in terms of volume and light conditions, it is possible to exhibit different types of art simultaneously at MOCA, like a 14th century cabinets of curiosity, to experience the multiple disciplines that exist in the world of contemporary art. It will also be possible uh, for MOCA to explore transdisciplinary exhibitions, therefore using this museum as a place where further types of art could emerge. And given the stair uh, position and that it plugs in directly to each floor, eliminating any gallery, Different types of vertical enfilades of spaces can be arranged, dedicated to art or social spaces or mix. So if we look at the stairs stretched out and we see the spaces that it touches as it climbs vertically, the brown being exhibition space and the mustard being spaces dedicated to other events, we can see this is one possible scenario of, of an enfilade of spaces, spaces leading to other spaces directly. Uh, this is another. And as you see, the variation ends with a scenario where it's fully dedicated to, to exhibitions. The floors that host these spaces are designed in concrete. This is this lower area. And therefore, giving us naturally it's our, our, our kind of finished concrete floor throughout. The envelope that encloses these spaces is designed with a light steel frame to explore some of the other aspects of contemporary art. Its members are used to subdivide each face of the envelope with diagonal strips of metal cladding that continue diagonally from face to face, avoiding vertical orientation, so to defy a sense of gravity and weight. Single panels are bent around the corners to reinforce the diagonal banding, and a running bond pattern is used to reduce the presence of other orientations. The panels have to change width, as you see here on this drawing, to keep the banding continuous across the faces. But this has to negotiate with manufacturing limits. In the case of stainless steel panels, which come off a coil, the panels could not be less than three feet eight inches in width. Also, the insulated glazing panels could not be manufactured less than two feet wide. These panels, uh, th these widths, determine the variety of corner panels we could use. Aside from which 70% of the panels retain the same length, which helps to maintain the sense of diagonal continuity. On the other hand, the change of the panel width that generates as a consequence of the bands going around the corner impacts the way light reflects on each one of the faces, which we will see later. Long, narrow windows follow the diagonal geometry of the metal strips, irrespective of the floors within. And the presence of floors is concealed from the exterior by mirror spandrel panels to remove any sensation of load. Consequently, on the exterior, the envelope evokes a sensation of scalelessness and lightness. To introduce the dimension of time and a sense of the transitory, the metal cladding strips are designed in black mirror stainless steel, which appears gray on an overcast day, as if an industrial building, blue if there is a blue sky and a mix of colors when it reflects the nearby context. The cladding surface is therefore not a static field of black, but rather a constantly shifting surface. A highly engineered surface with acute tolerances had to be uh, designed so that the strips would be extremely flat as they came together, and the joints would be minimal to allow images to continue across the joints. 
On the other hand, each panel is designed to create an oil can effect within it. This produces circular micro indents within each panel, resulting in an indeterminate depth in the cladding surface. You can just about see kind of circular whooshes inside, inside each one of these bands. On some faces, these pools uh, of indentation are the same size as the panels are the same in width. And on the others, they vary, and therefore these pools, uh, these indents, vary in scale. The variation of depth within the panel produces refraction rather than simple reflection of the context. It stretches the context. It compresses it. It refigures it. It delays it. It displaces it. It multiplies it. The oil can nature of the panel performs outwardly too, as it projects the sun onto the pavement in the shape of circular hoops, visualizing the, 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 the sun, the straight rays of the sun, into circles on the pavement, forming a transient landscape of light interwoven with the shadow, shadows of leaves that project on the pavement too. Therefore, extending the envelope of the, of the museum onto the pavement through light. This act between the envelope and the context changes, of course, continuously. When the stark materiality of the black surface appears, what allows the envelope surface to be read as something more than an expanse of darkness is that the cladding strips picks up the light of the surrounding environment differently due to the microsectional variation in its depth. At other times, the different orientations of the faces act by, by alternately reflecting the sky, the sky or the ground. This creates a kind of a theater set with a backdrop that changes, clouds, cars, and actors passing through this stage, changing shape, forming unexpected adjacencies of the sky and the ground, for example, a building across the street. Therefore, displacing the surrounding environment into a new reality construction. Similar to Robert Smithson's use of mirrors in his structures to displace properties to add or subtract. At MoCA, mirror is also introduced to the window reveals to displace depth of the wall with the lateral views of the landscape. Unlike the window reveals at Whitney or those at the Walker Art Center that emphasize weight and permanence and frame the exterior as it is, the mirror window reveals that MoCA dissolve the sense of weight and permanence and act as devices of displacement, displacing lateral spaces to the front, generating new landscapes throughout the day, revealing new relationships. What if a new Frank Gehry building is built facing MoCA? It would be better than the existing car park. What if pedestrian crossings are planned to cross diagonally at the junction of Mayfield and Euclid? Euclid. This um, is done at Tokyo, uh, all over Japan, and it avoids waiting behind slow lights to go across a junction. The mirror reveals intro introduce not only new thoughts, but also the experience of a reality constantly shifting, that it never rests. The mirror jams engage the sky, and specifically light as an activating agent. As the sun moves, as well as clouds, they create an almost kaleidoscopic effect of optical doubling and transmutation. The view down never stands still. At times, the banded pattern of the plaza and the landscape forming on the jams almost coincide with one another, becoming continuous. The phenomenal quality, the qualities of these elements of the museum have a magical double quality to them. They can be simultaneously reflective and absorptive. Uh, some play with singularity and multiplicity. Others play with shadow and light. Stephen told me that he found it utterly difficult to capture the essence of these elements, and he felt that he was photographing sport rather than a building as it moved all the time. On the exterior, Mocha's freestanding volume is like a theater in the round. 
with ent entrances on either side. You can just about see one there and one there, uh, but its form is not uniform all around. I think you can just see two other ones there. And in the, uh, whereas, for example, in the case of the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, DC which is also a freestanding museum, uh, in this case, the building or the museum is lifted above the ground and is uniform all, all the way around, and it evokes a sense of weight, a temporal, and monumentality. The different orientations of Mocha's envelope catch the light differently and develop different colors. They appear as if they, they are separate surfaces resting on one another. At night, this perception is created by the large triangular glass face, making the interior appear as hollow and the opaque surfaces leaning to support each other. The juxtaposition of the surrounding imagery onto the different faces further makes the surfaces distinct and resting on, on, on each other, like a house of cards. Mocha's shape changes with the point of view from which it is viewed as a consequence of the building geometry, giving different images of itself. In order to grasp its nature, you must project yourself through it. From certain points, it appears flat or skinny, and from others, deep or fat. From a distance, it, it is its prism-like form that engages one's perception as it is at odds with its extruded neighbors. Nearer to it, it is the orientation of its two rhomboidal faces. It's leaning in. This is the other one. And the apex of its six triangular faces that vary one's experience. Four triangular faces rise from the pavement to a sharp apex against the sky. Here, one's focus is lift, lifted upwards. Two triangular faces descend from the parapet down to the ground and bring one's focus down to the street level. And this continuously changes as you move around the building. Now, the triangular face acting as the principal entrance is entirely out of glass. And when the light is on or when you're closer to it, your view extends inwards. At night, the apexes disappear. So do the rhomboidal uh, faces and give way to surface imagery produced on the lower areas of the envelope surface. Here are some photos of people entering the museum. A kind of apprehension comes across of entering a new place. This was the opening part. <laughs> this was the opening party. Um, they are a little bit awkward, perhaps too, as rotating doors can be. Uh, in order to explore this moment of entering the museum as a space that is not the reality outside. The envelope is designed to produce a certain kind of surface tension between the experience of its exterior and that of its interior through its single envelope system, as if they are inversions of one another. Now, here is an image of the International Surrealism Exhibition in Paris designed by Marcel Duchamp. As a way to reject the modernist white walled galleries, he experimented with the gesture of inverting the interior as an exterior and up and down within the space to position art as an antidote to reality. The interior was turned into a darkened grotto. An iron brazier was installed in the center of the hall and artworks were hung on department store revolving doors. A similar inversion is introduced at Mocha between the two faces of its envelope. The envelope, as you see here, comprises of a vented rain screen over structural steel metal cladding, which acts in combination with the main superstructure framing, forming a rigid structural skin together, a kind of semi-monocoque structural skin that resists the building wind loads, similar to the way the steel panels in Yokohama are attached via a hilti gun to a steel frame behind, forming a stress skin panel. The interior structure is exposed to forge an inversion of the, of the inside and outside. Whereas the exterior face is a black mirror, stainless steel to emit reflectivity, lightness, and scalelessness, the exposed steel structure and, and metal decking require fire-resistant paint, and this is chosen in a very deep blue, deeper than the one you see here. This wraps around and all over the museum spaces, 
reinforcing the curatorial continuity and vertical interaction that the slanted walls can bring. Color has been removed entirely in contemporary art spaces. Historical museums displayed paintings on red, green, or blue walls to mitigate against the aging whites in old paintings. However, the intense colors at the back of the paintings takes the weight away from the paintings. Paintings appear light and floating. Similarly, a white cube space suffers from the same problem that art seems to float and has no weight. Add mocha. The contrast between the dark blue ceiling and the light walls introduces a sense of orientation into the gallery and a sense of weight which this time is on the lower, brighter end of the room on the artwork. The blue is sufficiently dark to recede and introduce a sensation of boundlessness, like an extensive sky or a deep sea to the galleries. For the same reason, Egyptians painted ceilings of their tombs in deep blue. When there is no natural light uh, the interior, um, entering the interior, the dark blue ceiling over Mocha's main galleries generates the illusion that the inside is outside and the weight is certainly on the artwork. Here are portraits of the public on the very first opening day of the museum. A strong feeling comes across. It's a kind of enhanced engagement with the art. I don't think any one of us can say that these people are distracted because they are not in a white cube. It is as if the dark ceiling acts as blinders, eliminating distraction from peripheral vision. allowing people to really focus. <laughs> the walls of the gallery are, of course, temporary and will move all the time. And the museum will sometimes block natural light completely with the sense of boundlessness of the ceiling will be more active and space will be more passive. At other times, the arrangement of the temporary walls will reveal the per perimeter blue walls and natural light will flow in. Here, space becomes more active, engaging with the art. And by the way, the artist exhibiting in this space chose to be in it. At night, the building is almost mute, with, ex with the exception of the window reveals uh, that display slices of the artwork into the street. You can just, it's, a, it's not a good photograph, but you can just see them. Mocha's ambition is, of course, to be a living room for Cleveland. You see this guy having falafel over the way, but soon he will be hanging out at Mocha. <laughs> the idea of a living room in a place is a place where people will converge, which feels like their own, rather than, say, a Cleveland outpost of MoMA. In the case of Mocha, this is explored through creating a building which is not a white cube and which responds specifically to Cleveland. Not a symbol of Cleveland, but a museum which is unique enough to be Cleveland's own. Unique in the way it is dialogic, evokes lightness, transience, boundlessness, and scalelessness all through a single building. That's it. Thank you. Answer some questions. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Um, since Farshid, <clears throat> sorry, since Farshid said that she is within her own community, so to speak, it would be great if um, you could really engage her. Uh, I know that in the discussion, I know that a group of uh, the lobes went to uh, to see this project, and I don't know if any of them are here and uh, have any thoughts. One thing that I would say, um, just by way of trying to begin the conversation, which was really a kind of uh, tour de force of, of, um, of explaining mm. something, is that in a way I think you emphasize so much this idea of the, the consistency mm. of operations, the consistency of the project, the, the fact is that everything is then part of a sequential narration because it's written 
and also you're responding both to your ideas but also to the photographs which are after the fact, which become part of the construct of writing, that the, the text in some way now constructs a new discussion around the project. You showing the Hirschhorn, I could say that um, I could also imagine writing a narrative that really talks about the affectual conditions of the Hirschhorn, of which is also a very important way to sort of discuss the project. So given the fact that affect becomes on one level through redescription a subjective project, there is, a, there is a moment when you're using the intensity of affectual conditions as a moment um, of getting into a project, of starting a project. So I think it would be interesting to talk a little bit about the question of inconsistencies rather than consistencies, because when we were in Cleveland, I remember that um, the clients were congratulating Farshid for having chosen the location that she did because when they bought the site they weren't actually imagining that the museum would be this singular object at the corner but that they thought that they would probably build a rectangular box further along where you have created some kind of a public space if I understand it correctly and that the location of the museum is an unexpected thing from there. So I think that that Prior to the description of the consistent narrative, there are actually certain things that are much more, I don't want to call them intuitive, but they're situational. They're to do with certain responses that are part of what is going on just in terms of locating the beginning of a project, which then goes through a process of becoming more and more part of the description of your consistencies, the way that you describe their functions. So I'm, I'm just curious whether you can talk about your project also in terms of certain moments of inconsistency, which you see in the facade in terms of what you describe as interruptions, but they also exist in terms of the making, in a way, of the project. So I'm, I'm just interested in that. I have to make sure I understand because yeah. I, I can, um, inconsistency can be interpreted in two ways. Uh, I actually gave, um, in the first year uh, I, I did the kind of contemporary art uh, museum, I, uh, I showed a, a PowerPoint of almost like five years of working on MOCA and the different iterations. Uh, it's a different lecture. Sure. It's a different lecture. Uh, there is no way that the project is conceived on day one. And actually, I think what, is, what I think is, is significant about a small building taking over six years is that it has allowed uh, me, the office, to uh, really grow with it and grow into the idea of a contemporary art museum. And I, I really believe I've learned a lot from it. And this is through trial and errors. Uh, and it's, it's, it's through digging into the subject. Um, so I, I don't by any means um, no, no, want to communicate a kind of a seamless process. But what I do want to encourage uh, which goes back to our, uh, my kind of earlier discussion, is a, a constant exchange between uh, the kind of, um, uh, the, if you like, the, the empirical and the non-empirical, or the, uh, say, the technical and the experiential side, that we don't make things and <coughs> then Expecting, expecting them to have certain consequences, but that we keep these consequences as part of the questions we explore as we construct. And I, this is the consistency I'm interested in, uh, but uh, as a larger question, in fact, I, what I am more interested in is the idea of multiplicity in a certain building. So the fact that the stair can be heavy and light, and the fact that a building, you can go around it and it never gives you a single image. So th there is no, intention to uh, reduce uh, the experience of, uh, of, of, of the building um, to a way I would see it. But ultimately, I think you, you mentioned the word subjective. I think it's impossible as an architect to escape being subjective. We make subjective decisions and we make exclusions by what we pick to work with and what we leave out. Uh, 
Um, so um, I don't know if I answered your sure. question. No, I didn't mean actually that there was there was. I was I wasn't I wasn't suggesting that you came up yes. with something no, that then you present. Yes. No, no. That that wasn't my point. Actually, I'll the, give you an example. Yeah, but the I want you to address this because you mentioned it. The fact that you said you started in two thousand and six and the the building opened just now. It's a six year process. So precisely, you did go through well, multiple iterations and. I think one of the things that's interesting is that it's Im impossible to make that kind of building without Absolutely. actually that time. Basically, so the project is, is a constant, uh, it's not a very elegant word, a, 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 a result of constant value engineering. Mm -hmm. Because when you have 18.7 million, everything has to work, you know? Everything you want to do, you, you, have, you, to do in those, uh, you have to do <laughs> in, those, in those elements. And, and, but I don't think, I, I, I think what is really amazing is that I, ultimately I think projects need to teach you and I think I've learned a lot through this exercise because, the, because it was a museum and the process of value engineering couldn't be, it couldn't be just money on the table, the issue of money. And uh, I, I think that the, the ambitions were elsewhere and uh, perhaps also through a, a sheer uh, kind of, uh, uh, sheer fate, uh, you know, things worked out. And I think that's the way things are. Sometimes they just don't work. Uh, it's a very small museum with a very tight budget, but, there are, but a very complex and, and uh, I think, amazing subject. Um, so these are some of the ways we managed to dig into it. But as a kind of, let's, let's talk about, I think, one of the examples you want to bring. At some point, uh, I was asked to go and make a presentation to, to a very potential potential donor who didn't become a donor um, and <laughs> unfortunately uh, and at that point we went from from London with a model of the museum and it was in gold now we started the, the building is is very uh, very close by to a Frank Gehry building the Peter Lewis building which has a kind of a, 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 a kind of a me metallic silver uh, wavy uh, uh, shape uh, as you can imagine and um, and at the same time, the Akron Museum uh, was being com completed, and it also used aluminium. And so, you know, you, you're dealing with little budget, with a small museum, you know, with, we wanted lightness, etc., to play with the industrial. Uh, you, go to st to, you go to aluminium because you can't usually afford stainless steel, and, but we didn't want it to be, uh, because we, we didn't have the scale of the Frank Gehry building, the shapes of the Akron Museum, it was simpler. And so we said, what about gold? We, we took it and thankfully, um, um, uh, one, one, um, one of the, one, one of the uh, uh, Persons who did become a donor, <laughs> she really reacted. Uh, she, she's on the uh, on the board. Um, uh, Toby Lewis. Um, uh, she reacted uh, quite badly towards the gold. And uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, she's uh, she's um, uh, you know a, a kind of a, an intelligent person and 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 very <laughs> well in the world of art. And, and at that point, as I said, our, our only reason for gold is not to be like the, the Frank Gehry or the Akron building. All of these other museums nearby, uh, they had no other reason. And so we went and it forced us to go back and search for some other. And accidentally, we came across the possibility of this black mirror stainless steel that I think has really formed the project. So, you know, you, you try along the way to steer the project along a certain path. Uh, but you also have to reframe this all the time, and the, and the space is quite accidental, and most of the time is out of your control, but you have to come on top, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and somehow you make decisions. Mm -hmm. Michael, um, any, any questions? Can we also get the mic over there? Please, Michael, go ahead. I have two, um, is it on? Is it on? I have two observations. I'm not sure that they're related. It's not on. Sorry? It's not on, the mic. Um, we can hear you anyway. Yeah, no, but we're filming. Um, um, and I'm, what I'm looking for is a, is a more general uh, attitude. Um, we compare the, we think about the Hirschhorn for a second. We think about the Hirschhorn for a second. <laughs> <laughs> They're both on. I just don't yeah, okay. I can hear they're you. They're going to turn. turn. Yeah. Go on. Okay. Um, if you think about the 
Hirshhorn and Whitby. There was, a, there was a moment when the, the museum was almost like a defense mechanism against whatever the environment, or the city, in both of those buildings. I mean, the, in, in contemporary journalism, the Whitby was called a, a Kunstbunker. It was a protection for art mm. against the city, against the environment. And if you think of, um, you know, Victoria Ito spoke last week, um, and he talked about the media tech as dissolving into Sendai, which is the city of trees, or, or a continuity between contemporary media and, a, and an almost ancient sacred view of landscape. Or if you think about Yokohama, which, which you, I think you said disappears. Mm. And even in the, the, the Mocha, the building in some ways wants to become the environment. And I'm trying to understand that attitude, which seems mm. to be a bit, oh, blur, yeah. or, or blur, think of blur, it wants to yes. become the environment. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of what that, um, um, Okay, maybe if I yeah. could try, yeah. I, these are things that are, these are, these are, uh, you know, uh, developing, um, <laughs> Uh, these are developing, uh, you know, um, uh, thoughts, so um, I'm not sure if I can be very clear about it. But I'm less interested in consistency between the projects, uh, but a more general attitude. So I would be worried if everything was to disappear into the context, like Yokohama, because in that sense, we were trying to, you know, invert the monumentality of big buildings, and that was a way to do it. Um, I, but I think there is, I think there is something cooking <laughs> in terms of uh, the dematerialization uh, of structure, space, and form. So being highly interested in the structure, space, and form, but trying to extend it uh, to, the, to the moment where it dematerializes and attaches to people. And I think that that's the discussion of affect. That that and you know and and rather than you know it's as I said it's a, it's a space on the construction of seeing how you actually uh, deal with this and and uh, it's maybe too early. And it just but I think it has for me it had something to do with um, uh, e either a different mode of representation. I mean these buildings neither Yokohama nor uh, Mocha can be represented in any conventional way. Well, photography, but that's not a representation of a building, whereas in an earlier moment, the building and the representation were um, integrally tied in the 60s, say, and through the 70s. But at this moment, it, it, it's impossible to draw Yokohama in conventional techniques. It's impossible to draw Mocha. And I think there's a, there's a, 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 a move away from conventional, not conventional, just a move from representation full stop toward something that requires an actual experience, that you actually have to bodily be there. Yes. You can't represent it fully. In, uh, you have to in, I, I in your body I think you're really right. Yeah. And I really think uh, Mocha more than the others, and maybe it's because I've been more uh, conscious uh, of of this uh, investigation is really that it's a building that you've got to experience, and that's why I thought it was extremely important to have a great photographer photographing it because, um, and and it, it taught me a lesson because initially I thought we what you would have to make uh, little videos, but I think the problem of them is that they literally should take you through the time experience. And in order to analyze and discuss in this kind of setting, actually I think it's important to freeze them. So that then you can next time be able to think backwards and to construct such instances. Uh, whereas a movie is literally the experience. So I actually think photography, uh, the, the right photography, it, keeping it, you know, knowing also what time frames and what moments is, uh, is a way, is a way. Um, obviously, in terms of drawing, Mocha is a simple drawing, to, a simple building to draw. Yokohama was always difficult. We were always having battles, um, you know, in terms of air building area calculations of the building because we were cutting it at this level. The client was cutting it at that level. It was more difficult. But Yokohama is more. Uh, <clears throat> it's not quite the same as Mocha because Yokohama is more uh, close to the tradition of engineering buildings or, or structures, so some aspects of, of that could be 
discussed more directly through, you know, like uh, construction documentation. The, the tradition of that building is really more the section. Um, so yeah, I don't know. But yeah, maybe, thing, maybe, you know. maybe. But but however, I I think it's. Um, I think when we were working on Yokohama, we were so excited by our digital tools because we were the first generation that really engaged the computer directly uh, and didn't hand it over to others. And we were so excited by that, and we were so excited, obviously, with this scale of building we were dealing with, that, and we were therefore so excited by the issue of process that all we talked about was process. And I do think that there is another lecture on Yokohama to be given in a different way. <clears throat> and uh, I, you know, I think retrospectively, I see a different story to it. Mm. Uh, and, and I think this is what is interesting, that sometimes you do things consciously, sometimes subconsciously. There is, just down here, did you change your mind? Hey. Um, I don't know how this came to mind, but I think you used the word subversion at the beginning so many times, more than effect, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, and I think what, what it brings to mind is uh, sort of the Deleuzian uh, distinction between smooth and striated space. So if, if the Yokohama was, you know, like an ideal smooth space, you know, it was fluid, open, um, terrain-like, um, and in a way kind of allows for um, a sort of uh, nomadic experience, you know? I totally buy the subversion. But with time, especially towards the end, like the, the project you emphasize at the end, um, it seems your space has moved more to striety space. It's more closed off, it's more walls and, and floors. Um, so one wonders how and, and what subversion means towards the end of your uh, you know, lecture? Well, the, 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 the inversion, which is perhaps a more positive way of talking about subversion, in the case of MOCA is, is, is in the context of what other kinds of museums, uh, the, the earlier museums that I was showing, that they are static, that they are uh, an institution, that they've become something uh, other than just art spaces. So. The, the kind of the project of MOCA is to bring it down to just the space for contemporary art and let other things to be subsidiary, rather than have a very big building where art has to then find its space in a box inside. Uh, and so that's what the inversion is in the case of the, the MOCA project. And I think in that sense, I think it's quite, um, maybe it's also due to lack, the lack of means that we've, uh, we've managed to do this. Uh, but I think it's quite radical. I, I think you won't find contemporary art museums that uh, work in this uh, multiple way right now. Aside from the fact that I don't think you're going to find any contemporary art space that is not white. And I think that's highly inversion type. Scott is looking very dubious. <laughs> <laughs> He's a like museum to... specialist. <laughs> Your, your, your museum that you showed last year. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do this. <laughs> Don't do this. Okay, somebody else is down there. Okay. No, 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 no. No, 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 let's go there. I'm just kidding. Okay. I was just teasing. Okay, now go, please. No, no, go ahead. No, no, no please, it's yours. Um, Farshid, thank you for the presentation. That was great. Um, I graduated last year, and just like any other very young designer, I'm, I have this dilemma with um, process of selection. And what I mean by that is, during your design, you have control over few aspects of your building and analyze it, and then the other ones, the, the effect is more um, after effect or more accidental. So I'm, I'm wondering, especially now where we have all these simulation tools and um, analysis tools where you can actually analyze um, everything, every aspect of your building to the point of exhaustion. How do you select what to analyze um, and control and how much of your design is free and you're just waiting for, your, for the building to reveal its whatever it's going to do or its effect? Um, 
Uh, for for example, I mean, I, like the 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 glare that you showed, you can you can easily analyze that and and say this is going to be problematic, and I'm not going to go with that. But you chose to um, give the the building a certain <coughs> freedom to do what it's want to do, and then learn from it. So, how do you? Uh, you choose? know, I am actually quite amazed by how much today you can visualize. For example, the the, the different faces reflecting the the ground and the sky is something that we we, I have an, a rendering of it on the computer, um, and we did that. We were not entirely sure how, 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 how successful it would be. We knew it would happen, but we didn't know exactly the intensity that would happen. I think it's more intense than we thought. But it's certainly the, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this effect of, as I said, the ground and the sky coming together and these accidental uh, images forming is something that we predicted and when we visualized. But, but maybe those, those kind of uh, finer uh, imagery that comes, the, uh, the, the, if you like, um, 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 almost like the disintegration of each area into small areas, that's, that's not something that we, we thought it would happen. We knew that the circular areas perhaps would happen because of the oil tank is something that we've done a mock-up. And that's, that's the other, when it comes to the kind of the physical material, especially for the special features of a building, you do mock-ups. So we did mock-ups. And certain changes were made, you know. Certain changes were made that were good. The size of the joints, I went around the corner, I ended at the top. The mirror reveals came at the mock-up of the building. They were not there. And it's something that seemed to be, um, you know, it was an idea that came up then. So I think you are all the time, that's what makes the process of design so exciting because it, and that's what's so unexciting when you hand it, when you have to just do a concept design and somebody else carries it over because there is a world of other ideas that emerge when you are dealing with construction. And what is really interesting is the kind of perhaps narrative, whether it's uh, made of a continuous line or, or discontinuous, you, you project finally from the beginning to the end. That's how the building lives in the end. Um. Tell us, can you get the mic? I'll just ask you a quick question. Tell us a little bit about your experience of, of Cleveland compared to, let's say, doing projects in the UK or doing Japan, just in terms of your first American project. Mm. Did you notice anything that was different in terms of, for example, the realization of the <laughs> Somebody project? Somebody's smiling there. And its methods um, we, and so I have to mention that we we're working with uh, an architect of record who is uh, Paul Westlake, who is an ex-GSD student who was on the board uh, of MOCA and he was just a, a great colleague. So, I, I mean, that, um, um, that collaboration uh, just made it, you know, um, enjoyable, let's say. Uh, the building industry in the US, I don't have such a high opinion of. Uh, Simple uh, things you don't manage to do. It's like the art of DIY seems to have been lost, at least at the scale we were dealing with. Uh, I have an ambition to redesign toilet partitions for the US. Um, uh, you know the ones that we have here at the school where you find them everywhere. Uh, you know, they are very low, so you see people's feet. And uh, I am fine because I'm short, but you're, if you're a little bit taller, you can even look over. It's awful. Uh, and you, and I, I became so obsessed with this that I went to all the recent museums and visited their toilets and took pictures because I was convinced that, for example, Sana would have managed to solve this, <laughs> but they didn't. They all have the same terrible, inadequate toilet partition, which I think is very important. So I have lots of ideas. <laughs> she was looking for evidence to go back to the client, but she couldn't find the evidence. Uh, you had your hand up, yes, please. Um, thank you for the lecture. Um, oh, that's very loud. Okay, one thing that really um, struck out to me was that image of, um, you know, how you're talking about the blue wall, um, a blue ceiling and, and the white walls, um, how they work in conjunction. And I was just thinking how in the art world, it's very political to have, 
you, you're not supposed to technically have an art fair in a museum context because of the political implications of commercial versus the cultural. But what I thought was interesting was that with your work, it was the first instance where I could sort of imagine an art fair being, it, it, it's, I've never imagined an art fair taking place in the museum, but when I've been to, because when I've been to art fairs, I've always felt that the walls were almost too high and it was, it was like the walls were reduced to a scale that was manageable to almost have an art fair in a museum. So what I thought was that you said that you were trying to, you're always trying for this A effect for a new subjectivity. And I don't think it's not, I don't think it's just necessarily an architectural subjectivity. Um, and I don't think it's just a subjectivity between the artwork and yourself. And I think it's a new subjectivity that you're creating for the art world in a way that it's a political implication for the art world that, that you're kind of provoking. And I, I don't know whether you thought of that and whether I'm misinterpreting it. Um, just... No, no, I, I mean, you know, the, 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 some of the decisions taken for the museum, I think are, have been, were very risky. Uh, for, example, uh, for example, the blue interior. And, uh, you know, I, I am still amazed that they went for it. Mm. Uh, I am, you know, and we had to, in a way, introduce it quite softly into the scene and not push for it. And uh, I learned it's, good, it's a good way to do things. Um, and um, <laughs> for the first time, <laughs> I have to remember. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, but then a whole, once, um, you know, once, once somehow uh, the museum director and board were uh, embraced it, we had to go out and talk to, you know, artists, curators to really ask opinion. Uh, and we learned a lot because originally it was supposed to be an Eve Klein blue, which was part of the diagrams I showed. Uh, and the more we talked uh, to, to artists, curators, museum directors, everyone felt that it would work if it was dark enough to recede. So it would be dark before it's blue. Uh, and uh, talking about trial and errors, even when, the first, when, the, when it was painted, the color we thought was right from a swatch, Everyone, you know, we thought that it was still too light, so it was painted a second time. Even on, it was, the whole thing was painted. So, um, and, and thank, you know, it's, it's wonderful that we managed to do that because it would be terrible to, to get that wrong. Um, and so I, I think that it, it became a measured risk, but originally I think it was a big risk. And uh, so far, it seems that the art world who've seen it um, think it works. Any other? Thoughts? Fashi, thank you so much thank for you. a wonderful thank you. Thank, you. thank you. thank you. Show them, show them gold first, and then they'll agree to the blue. <laughs>